Hello. Hi, if I could have everyone's attention, please. Okay, so it's about a little bit past 1030 and we're going to start our healthcare segment first. So uh, the featured speakers today are Will Center from the international, he's the director of the international funding organization at Phillips Healthcare. We have uh, Dr. Dania Baugh from the Heart Institute of the Caribbean, as well as Dr. Ernest Maddy from the Heart Institute of the Caribbean. So Will Center, uh, he is, the, once again, the director of the international funding organization, and he has vast experience in uh, overseas and in international waters for the, like, over the past 30 years. And Ernest Maddy is the chairman and CEO of the IHS Group, and IHS Group is a national-based company focused on emerging markets. Um, they basically focus on healthcare and technically um, technology applications. Also in the Caribbean, they have pioneered the Heart Institute of the Caribbean, which is the regional center of excellence for cardiac care. In Nigeria as well, they run something called the Doctors on Call Service, or DOCS, which um, includes concierge medical counsel, national medical call service, and remote patient monitoring services. So Dr. Tanya Ba, especially, is the president of the IHS group and she is um, one of the only holistic, she's the only doctor in Jamaica that has a holistic medicine like uh, accredita accreditation. And um, both Dr. Madhu and Dr. Ba are board certified US trained physicians. So um, we will have uh, one of the members of the leadership team circling around with a microphone during the presentation. So if you have any questions, just try to get their attention. So. Every, so everyone can hear you and what's being said because that was a little bit of a problem with the last session. And uh, it's just gonna be a panel session, so please hold your questions until the end and all three of our speakers will answer at that time. So we'll center, everyone. Picking up, all right, here we go. Um, first of all, uh, I uh, chosen not to do a PowerPoint and I hope you will all forgive me. Um, it's, a, it's a habit uh, that I, I've been in all my life. I, I find them very entertaining, but uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good test to see what you're picking up orally and see, I think you get more interaction when you have a conversation. So let's, let's see what we can do with this. Uh, I want to first of all uh, thank uh, Professor Ramamurti and Dean Courtney and, and uh, Jake Moody for uh, uh, inviting me and getting me here. Um, it's always an experience to go down Storo Drive if you're not from Massachusetts. So uh, I got here okay and uh, fortunately the sun's shining and I didn't have to shovel my way through the last 50, 50 meters. Um, what I'd like to do is to um, tell you a little bit about Phillips and then, uh, and then tell you a little bit about my function within the company and then talk about some opportunities that I see and maybe that'll spark some imagination in your minds about you know, wh where you might perhaps pursue a career. And, uh, uh, but because my entire focus is emerging markets. Um, so to start with, Philips is a uh, Dutch-based multinational firm. It's very, very large. Um, we have over 100,000 employees, uh, but our biggest presence is here in the United States. We've, we've got about 50, 50 sites, about 40 manufacturing facilities, some, t some 25 R&D centers, uh, we, we, are, we, are very, we have a very, very large healthcare uh, footprint here. Um, the company as a whole is uh, known for uh, lighting. We started our business producing light bulbs in the 19th century. Um, and, uh, but today, healthcare has overtaken uh, the, the lighting business as the biggest component within the company. So uh, I want to I, I try to focus just on that segment. We do about $9 billion a year in, in various sales. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's, we're, we're number one or number two in a variety of, of uh, categories. Um, and in fact, the, uh, Dr. Madhu and, and uh, Dr. Bao would know more than I do what Phillips does because they actually use the, use the equipment. So um, my background uh, is in international, uh, international trade. And uh, here is a great pleasure for me to to meet Jim Paul again, who was a, was a colleague of mine for many years. Uh, I was in the commercial service on the other side of the map. Uh, and uh, I started, uh, I did nine years in China, uh, five years in Africa, two years in Pakistan. And uh, then for fun, I was five years in France and four years in England and, and then uh, did four years at the World Bank in DC. 
And uh, the commercial service um, is a very, very underrated, uh, and, uh, and, and it's like a best kept secret. It's an underrated organization, it's not very well known, uh, and it's incredibly powerful for people who want to start out their careers in international trade. Because just imagine you want to tap into the Indian market. Well, I don't, we have at least seven offices in India. It's, uh, it's, and, he, and Jim just mentioned they have 14 offices in China. Well, the first time I went to China, we were operating out of a hotel in, in Beijing. So it was a, it's, it's a big change. But imagine if you want to, uh, if you're representing a company and they're expecting you to do something in international uh, space, uh, these people are, are paid to be welcoming. Uh, and it just makes a, you can have, they can establish your first contact in a country or a market that you're interested in and your business could grow from there. One of our, one of our early success stories was a small company uh, in the 80s who came and, and did one of our, our international partnership searches in Brazil, uh, a company that was called Microsoft. And, uh, and the point here is, is that big companies start as small companies. You know, we can, I, I'm not, I can go into the Philip story, uh, but you know, we, you know, the company teetered on its own existence in the beginning until we got a, we got a, a deal for 50,000 light bulbs in, in the, from the Tsar in Russia, and that's how our company took off. But um, um, just, again, a shout out to the commercial service. Um, very, very welcoming, very easy way to explore markets that you may be interested in. Okay, so what my function in Philips is, is actually quite an interesting one. I, uh, they were attracted to my services because I had spent four years at the World Bank and I had spent three years at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is another powerful institution that very, very few people uh, have ever heard of. Um, they have, Philips has 17 market teams and uh, what we don't call uh, these, some of these markets emerging uh, markets, we call them growth, growth markets because that's the real relevance to us. Uh, but they needed somebody in Washington who could connect the business to the, the sources of donor funding. And uh, I had a background in it, and, and I started working for them to do just that. Um, in Washington, D.C., and all of these, I want to touch upon some institutions, and, uh, and, and these are all prospects for people who are interested in international development and in emerging markets. But the big kahuna in Washington, D.C. is the World Bank. Um, it has a very large balance sheet, and it does about between 30 and 40 billion dollars of lending each year to, to uh, a, these growth markets. Um, the World Bank, it's, it's really quite incredible. Um, it sits less than uh, half a mile from the White House and very few Americans will wander in there. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of, it's, it's a fascinating institution. And, and the reason I think Americans who get up the, the courage to go to Washington to search for funding, they'll go to the Defense Department, you know, they'll go to Capitol Hill, uh, they might go to USAID where they speak English and everything, but in, in the World Bank, your first point of contact could be a, a Korean who is supervised by a Brazilian, and that seems to freak everybody out. But uh, that's, that's, it's, a, uh, it's a very large source of funding um, that is aimed at development outcomes. And in the, in the case of the, the conversation today, it's about healthcare outcomes. They are very big in, in, in Africa. They are the, they're the biggest lenders in Africa in the healthcare space. And if you want to incre improve primary care systems, which is a, a, a current focus, the World Bank is a key partner. So within the World Bank, uh, they have a few different lending windows, but there's also an organization called the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank group. Um, they, they are growing, they're the fastest growing component of this uh, organization. They, they're very interesting because I think in the next 10, 20 years, you're going to see a, a, uh, it, the trend will continue that the investment in growth economies is going to be from the private sector and not necessarily public sector spending. So what, what was really attractive to a company like Philips is uh, we meet Dr. Bao and, and, and we convince her that we really do have better equipment than our competitors. And, uh, and we, make a, we, we agree on, on a t some targets and, uh, and we come to a partnership where, where if she's satisfied with us, we only have to negotiate with one person. When you do other types of, of, of uh, if you try to pursue World Bank opportunities as a, uh, as a contrast, that's public sector money. That's money that's lent to governments. And because it's public money, everything has to be competed and transparent. 
and it's a very long and problematic process. The volumes are great, and that's why the World Bank is very significant, and you can't ignore them. You try your best to shape the deals and make sure that they're as transparent as possible, but funny things happen at the very end of the, many of these, these transactions, and it's, a, it's, a, it's far surer to go with a private sector partner uh, if you're interested in growing your business. And one day, if you're interested in joining the private sector, that's all they care about is growing your business. So think about the IFC. Um, there is another organization at the World Bank Group called the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Association. They do political risk insurance. Jim Paul touched upon this about when the question came up about how do you hedge your risks. Um, political risk insurance is a good idea. Depending on the, on the structure of the transaction, you can get, the, you can get a cover insurance products from the U.S. Uh, Export-Import Bank. Um, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation is another unknown entity in the U.S. Uh, in Washington that, uh, that provides political risk insurance and financing. And it goes on and on and on. I'm not going to, I don't want to bore you with the, the whole list, but I'll just, I mean, I won't go into the details of the whole list, but let me just name a few that I've already uh, I've overlooked. The Inter-American Development Bank, largest regional development bank in the world, based in Washington, D.C. Um, the Department of Energy, they finance um, uh, uh, LED lighting. They finance, uh, um, uh, prim well, we're looking at them primarily from LED uh, lighting, which is a business line we're in. Um, the EPA, they finance cook stoves. Philips has a company, has a target to um, sell a million cook stoves by 2018 in, in Africa. Is that going to contribute to our, our $30 billion uh, revenue stream? Not very much, but it's very significant in terms of health outcomes because there are lots of, of uh, respiratory diseases and, and so forth which are caused by people who are cooking over open fires and otherwise inefficient ways. So we're, we're very much established in, 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 in base of pyramid solutions, and, and that's just one, one example. Other examples are we make uh, solar lighting and we make uh, uh, some, some devices for mobile ultrasounds, wind-up fetal Dopplers, and, and, and so forth for, for uh, clinics in Africa that are off the grid. But I, I digress. I'm just going to mention, let's see, a few more. US EPA, uh, OPIC, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Um, it just goes on. So there are probably, I'll just, I'll just stop here. There's, there's in, on this segment, there's, there are about eight institutions within a mile of where I sit in DC that are lending in the billions, of, or altogether, if you add them all up, are probably lending about $50 billion uh, into these various markets. So that's my job. Phillips uh, gave me a, uh, you know, some nice quarters, you know, nice benefits, and they've pointed me in this direction, and my job is to try to connect them. But the only way we're going to succeed is if we're talking, on the, on the, if we're, if we're talking the same language as everyone else, which is outcomes. We are no longer a company that makes a nice product and ships it out to a distributor and you know, expects the, the uh, sales to occur and, and then we, we uh, count up the tally at the end of the year. We have to be a solutions-oriented company. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're talking about emerging markets, that's how, that's how it will work for you. you. You need to listen to the customer and listen to what they want and find a way to provide them uh, w the, with exactly uh, the things they're looking for. The other component about my position within Philips is, is New York uh, and the, the United Nations specifically. Um, I wanted to bring that up because that's another target of opportunity for young people um, uh, starting their careers. The UN has 37 different agencies. They're going through reform right now, but at the present time, they all have their own independent procurement procedures and, and policies and so forth. So they're, they're trying to streamline these things. But far more than, than a source of, of procurement, the, the UN is a powerful convening body. They have, uh, they have boots on the ground in a number of, in a very, very many places, um, and they act as, as a force to, to bring, to bring uh, all the different donors together and all the governments together to come up with, with, with mutual goals and, and, and targets. So I, I, I get to go up to New York once in a while, which is, which is kind of fun. So, um, well, I just, I got a few statistics I'll share with you, and I'm, I'm gonna try to wrap this up quickly to, to give the others a chance to speak. Um, the, the demographics are, are, are very much in favor of, of emerging markets or growth markets. Um, by, by 2033, 60% of the global GDP will come from these, these regions. Um, we predict that, uh, uh, well, of course, China and India will double their GDP uh, within 12 years or 15 years. 
Uh, we predict 7,000 large companies will, uh, out of 7,000 large companies that we expect to be created in the next uh, 20 years or so, 70% uh, of them will come from these, these uh, territories. Um, and uh, that the demands for energy, water, food, and commodities like steel are just going to be tremendous. So in all of these areas, there's a lot of work to be done. But uh, just to go back a little bit, to backtrack a little bit about the UN, in 2000, they established the Millennium Development Goals. Um, the fourth goal was to reduce child mortality. The fifth goal was to improve maternal health. Um, and the targets was this year, 2015. This is, the, this is the come up, you know, this is the time to see how they did. And the, and the truth is, is they made progress in some of the areas and others they, they lagged. So um, what's happening right now, and this is a good year to focus on uh, emerging markets and development because everyone, everyone is trying to th rethink their, their positions. In, in September, there's going to be, uh, the UN will announce the Sustainable Development Goals, which are designed to replace the Millennium Development Goals. They've already got 17 or 18 goals. It's already more or less put to bed. What they haven't figured out is how to finance them. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of effort um, right now um, to, um, uh, to come together to figure out how to finance public health, let's say, which is the area that, we, that we're talking about. We're talking about affordable health care, access to health care for people who, who have life-threatening illnesses or conditions. And, and it's, a, it's an imperative uh, that we all work on it, and we've got to figure out how to finance it. So that, to me, this is, this is the big question. This, and this, you know, it's a challenge to, to anybody here. And please give me your comments. You don't have to ask questions. If you have an idea, I would love to hear it. How, how, do you, uh, how do you engage the private sector, which is an important source of, of resources, in a, a region like Africa uh, to supply the, te the needed technology and instruments to uh, increase uh, uh, health outcomes or improve health outcomes and, and increase access? How, how do you do that? Because, you, you know, the, we, we, sure, we have resources, but if we don't turn a profit, we go out of business and we go away. So we have to figure out some way, and it, the whole notion of public health as a public good is a tricky question. You know, how, this, these are very important questions, and this is, this is what, we're, uh, what we work on every day. So a couple of ideas that are flo being floated out there is a, um, um, the con more conditionality on the lending. So for instance, right now, I, I, I focus a lot of my time in Africa, but it's not exclusive. I do Eastern Europe and, and Asia as well. But, uh, um, what we're finding in Africa is that as economies improve and as the tax base widens, um, the governments are putting the money into roads and putting the money into other areas and not health. And the reason they're not putting it into health is because the donor community is going to come to the rescue. So we're, there's the, you know, people are kind of getting tired of this and there's, there's trying to put in some more conditionality into the lending that says if we give uh, Congo, this is a real example, $250 million. We want to see, see some uh, guarantees from the government that they will start to ring fence uh, some money for, for either health, universal health coverage, universal health insurance, or other areas to strengthen the overall system. So, um, uh, so fin figuring out how to finance these things is really, uh, is really key. Uh, we do, I'm gonna, just going to do one bit of advertising on a solution that we have, and then I'll wrap, and that's the last, my last remark. It's uh, something called a community life center, and we've, we're piloting it in, in, uh, in, a, in a county just outside of Nairobi. And it starts with light. We are a lighting company after all. And it's kind of hard to imagine here in Boston, but there are a lot of communities out there where when the sun goes down, that's it. The activities are very limited. So we, we slap up some lights uh, and we create a, a safe and clear uh, pathway to a clinic that is also clean and safe and, and people can, can approach it. Uh, and, and what it's, it's aimed for is for, for mothers to have uh, deliveries. And we have, in order for this to be sustainable, we brought in a solar unit, so this thing can operate off-grid. And we're founding a couple of other ways to uh, generate revenue. Uh, the most important one is uh, accurate statistics that we can feed back to the government so that they will reimburse us for, for services that are, that are carried out. Uh, and we're doing this, by the way, in conjunction with the county government. It's not a Phillips facility, it's, it's, a, it's a county facility. Uh, and then we set up a water tower um, selling clean water, not just to the clinic, but to the whole community outside. 
And then we sell, have a little store, and we sell some things in the, in the store and so forth. But this simple little thing, the pieces aren't that impressive, the, but it's in high demand because the, the politicians need to provide health care to their constituents. And uh, we can do it off-grid. Uh, we're piloting it very successfully. It's gone up like this in terms of people are coming from 30 kilometers away just to use our facilities. And it's exciting, and it's, it's good work. It's like you feel really good when you, when you, you, know, when you build a clinic like that and you've, and you've improved the health outcomes. So I'm sure I've gone over my limit. I apologize. No pictures, okay? You can boo me later, but uh, thank you very much. All right, so this is actually, I think, a very kind of symbiotic talk. It's, it's a perfect setup. Um, one that you will notice as students, uh, as people trying to decide where your life is going and, and what directions you're going to take, you're going to have all the benefit of your very, very advanced um, education but then you'll have to make some decisions with that, some real world decisions as to, once I've had all this information, what do I do next? So you're thinking, okay, am I gonna do trade? Am I going to export something? Am I gonna make um, the newest um, version of Apple and I'm going to be you know, Steve Jobs and, and then I'm gonna sell it to the world? Um, well, the truth of the matter is that right now there's so many areas in the developing world, in what we call the emerging markets, that very well may not be selling things to them, that very well may not be making something new and sending it off, but in identifying areas of lack, areas of deficiency, areas of um, a service gap, and being that for that community. And so when you're looking at emerging markets and you're thinking of the giants, the, the BRIC countries, you're looking at Brazil, you're looking at Russia, India, uh, China, and then you're adding in Indonesia and you're looking at South Africa, you may find that they have gaps in certain things that you could export to them, but that they're not gaps in other areas where you play strongly. So in our particular um, example, we play strongly in healthcare. And when you look at Brazil, their healthcare is just fine. We couldn't see an area in which we could play. Um, Russia does very well in the area of healthcare. India actually wants to export their healthcare to the rest of the world, and, and the Apollo centers are busy looking at, at putting foothold um, in other areas of the developing world. So while they may be an emerging market for other areas, like uh, Jim Paul said, you have to also look at your particular market. So what we did, we looked at what we were strong at, and we came at it from a position, not so much from a business perspective, but I think from a scientific perspective, which says, you know, you have, the patient comes in with a complaint, and the complaint is, I have poor access to healthcare, or my healthcare outcomes are not the same as they are in a developing, in a developed country. And so you come up with a set of differential diagnoses. Okay, so what can I do to ameliorate this problem. And then you come up with a solution and you try to put that solution into play. And so there are very many areas in the developing world, in emerging markets, in which healthcare is a big growth industry. Not only do they have healthcare delivery problems, they have a lot of medical issues that would need them to buttress their healthcare delivery um, solutions. And so you can, play in that market. It may be water. It may be any other service industry. And so what I want you to do is to broaden your horizons, um, to not just think about making something and distributing or exporting, to not necessarily think about it only as trade, but to also think about it in service delivery of um, things that you may traditionally consider a government's responsibility. But in many of the developing markets, the government is either uninterested in cer certain areas or overwhelmed by their multiple responsibilities in other areas. And where there are needs, 
if you're enterprising, you're always going to find a place to play. So let's talk about um, healthcare opportunities. So we sat around in Nashville. We were both on faculty at Vanderbilt University um, Medical School. And Vanderbilt has a reputation, well, Nashville in general has, has a reputation for being very aggressive in healthcare technology, in healthcare business. And pretty much all the medical businesses that you see around the country um, either had their start, their incubation, or their um, initial kind of you know, viral, viralization from Nashville. Um, you look at uh, Hospital Corporations of America, HCA, Nashville. Um, you think of dialysis, um, Nashville. And Harry Jacobson um, was one of the big starters of the whole dialysis um, spread to, to um, America where you'd have, you know, outpatient dialysis and patients would be able to um, extend their life cycle and increase their comfort, for example, by going to outpatient dialysis and doing it three times a week and still being able to kind of continue to work. And he um, ultimately became the vice chancellor of Vanderbilt University. And so it was a big thrust among the faculty to think of ways that you could commoditize, for, for want of a better word, healthcare, and also to make it um, not just for the public good, but also ways that you can make a business of it, because we know that if something is not for profit, ultimately it dies. Anything that relies on giving totally relies on the giver. And if the giver changes their mind or has different or competing interests, then if you're sitting waiting on charity to come in, as you talked about, you, you very well may find yourself stuck midstream. So we started looking around and of course we start thinking what are going to be the best markets and, and why? And you know, what we looked at was um, one of these things, it's called the 80-20 rule. And uh, Vilfredo Pareto observed in, the, in uh, 1906 that 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the population. And so when you look at the distribution of the world GDP, it's pretty much the same, kind of the richest 20% have 82% of the income. And the second 20%, 11.75%, and down to the poorest 20% have 1.4% of the, of the world's income. Um, but then when you look at Pareto's rule in healthcare, the greater burden of disease is actually in low income countries. And so you start thinking 80% of global disease burden is in the poorest 20% of countries, while 80% of healthcare resources are in the richest 20% of countries. Now, smart, educated business people may run away from the 20% of the world because you start thinking, well, if that poorest 20% have 80% of the disease, how are they going to pay to deal with that global burden of disease? And so this is where some of the things that I'm gonna talk about later um, in our talk come into play. That it's not just about the numbers, it's also about um, some cultural understanding, it's also about learning the landscape um, of places that you're dealing with and recognizing that things that are necessary will find a way to get done. Um, if it has to happen, it will happen. And if it will happen and it needs to be paid for, why aren't you the one that's providing it, right? Um, so we know that they have 80%, so there's your market. 80% of the global healthcare needs 20 in, in, are in um, the 20% of the countries that are poorest. So you've got a market, and here is the other market. Total deaths around the world, 58 million. Deaths from non-communicable disease around the world, 35 million. So it tells you that most of the disease are things that either one, are preventable, or two, are treatable. You have a place to play. We're not talking about the, oh, I slipped and fell, 
and had a subdural hematoma, so now that's an accident. Or I was drinking while I was driving on a very windy road and drove my car over the precipice and I died. Or high violence and therefore I was shot and killed. Or ISIS has sprung up and so now there are tons of deaths related to violence. We're talking about I've been diagnosed with something and I have a window of opportunity in which to treat it. And in 20 years, if I haven't treated it, my answer is death and disability. And so I know that there's something I can do, number one. And two, I don't want to die, number two. And so number three, I'm going to find resources in order to deal with my issue, right? And so, um, when you look at the non-communicable diseases in developing countries, 28 million um, deaths from that. And in developing countries, which could have been prevented, 14 million. So you see, we're still dealing with kind of 50% and greater in things that we have an opportunity in which to play. And so we figured out that a new approach was needed and that new approach is not always waiting on governments. Because if they could have done something, they would have done something. And if they intend to do something, sometimes other things come in the way. It may be politics, it may be corruption, it may be just lack of access to funding. Um, and sometimes, you know, you need to show a path. You need to blaze a path and, and sometimes other people will follow. So the worsening indices of health status in, des in developing countries demand that we look at it in a fresh way. And not only do we look at it in a fresh way, but we look at actually how the health systems are organized. And one of the ways that you can look at it is by trying to apply technology, one, to drive costs down, and two, to make, to extend care with a fewer number of people, and that you can leave people in place in developed markets who can provide support remotely to developing markets. Um, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit and talk about how we chose where we decided to go. Um, we, of course, are not playing in any of the BRIC um, markets, but we're playing in a couple markets that we chose um, for good reasons. One, culture. Two, proximity to the U.S. And when you're looking at a healthcare business, manpower is a big part of it. And when you're looking at specialty care like we were, cardiac disease, specialized manpower becomes important. And so attracting um, that specialized talent becomes a challenge if you want that specialized talent to move from here to Afghanistan. But if you can move that specialized talent or rotate that specialized talent from here to the Cayman Islands or to Jamaica, which is where we're playing, it becomes a whole different discussion. And so what may not be um, the first idea when you're looking at kind of marketing indices or you're looking at, you know, GDP becomes a great idea when you're looking at the nuts and bolts of what you need to do. So we looked at culture, we looked at proximity, we looked at on the ground um, health systems. And of course, language also becomes a big part of it when you're talking also about um, bringing a US-based uh, first world type uh, healthcare delivery system to a developing country. You also look at what your competition is. You look at the disease burden and you look of course at the political structure because this is not something that you can necessarily put down and then diversify and start selling coal. So if you're doing healthcare, you're kind of on the ground, fixed in terms of infrastructural um, development. You're investing a lot in cath labs and echo machines. And so you're, you're, you're investing in, so you don't necessarily want your first uh, point of entry to be Afghanistan. Um, you also want to make sure that what you've put down that you are in the proximity as well, so you can be boots on the ground, you're there, you're um, monitoring what's happening, you're actively involved in growing your, your product, growing your markets, and 
getting entrenched not only with the community, but with the medical community as well, who are your primary referral sources. So you also want to establish some um, sense of camaraderie, some sense of that you're in for the long haul as opposed to being a carpet bagger where you're coming in because you know that 60% of the population are hypertensive and you know 58% of the population is going to die from cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to come and sweep all those up. I'm going to cath them. I'm going to, you know, do angioplasty. I'll send those who need bypass up to UPenn to get bypass and then we'll pocket all the money and in five years we're gone. So you want, you want the population to know that you're there, that you um, care about them, that you're gonna provide not just care but also public education to lift their healthcare literacy. So having said all that, um, one of the things we realized was there's low public awareness of appropriate technology options, especially in healthcare. And that's not just in the developing world, that's actually worldwide, that's in America as well. And we were struggling with our own healthcare delivery issues um, just a few years ago. The answer to that, one of the answers to that, appeared to have been Obamacare, and, and the jury um, has, is, is out on how that's ultimately going to play out. Um, but there's absence also of appropriate technology transfer and access to technological advances. Clearly, lack of in infrastructure and expert expertise in using the new technology. There's deficit in capacity building, high cost of capital, high cost of capital. So you want to do business in the developing world. And part of what keeps us developing also is a lack of imagination and is a lack of um, See, seeing it as it will be, as opposed to seeing it as it currently is. And so you go into a developing market and you're trying to interest them in building a specialty cardiac center. But that's not the way they've always done it. They're used to primary prevention, for example. And so they're focused on, they may be, I should say, focused on vaccine delivery or infant mortality or on maternal fetal risks. And what they're not seeing is that there has been an epidemiologic transition so that people are not dying anymore of whooping cough, of mumps, or of dengue in the Caribbean, or even of malaria in West Africa. But they're dying left, right, and center from cardiac disease, from diabetes, from the complications of untreated or poorly treated hypertension. And so you're taking the productive years of your population away from you. So now you've saved the child from dying at birth, but now there are no adults left to feed that child because that patient's in end-stage end renal disease, or the father has died from a heart attack at 42 or their cardiac cripples because they have heart failure and can barely walk a block before they're short of breath, but they're the ones that are supposed to be gathering firewood, or they're the ones that are supposed to be hunting the cow, or they're supposed to be carrying um, the produce that they farmed to the next town to catch the bus to go to the market in the next big city. So how is that going to work if you've taken away the productive years of your population. So you can't just focus on infant mortality. You can't just focus on vaccinating children, which you can get donations to do. You have to focus also on treating chronic disease. And so when you're going, though, to make that argument, sometimes it flies in the face of what is comfortable, what is usual, and change is difficult. So you're going to have to be willing to, one, do proof of concept sometimes. You have to sometimes go it alone if you believe in your um, model strongly enough. Um, so the high cost of capital and limited organized private sector involvement in healthcare services um, is an issue in healthcare delivery. And the absence of favorable policies to support and, and attract investment in healthcare and mitigate against the risk. So misconceptions about appropriate use of technology. People think, oh, you start talking about 
uh, technology, you're going to increase the healthcare costs. So no, why do we need echo machines? Or why do we want to put a cath lab? You know, why don't we just give them medications? And, and, and you know, that, that's going to cost me less initially. And that should be enough. We think that it's going to widen inequalities so that only the rich people who can afford it will pay for it and the rest of the people will die. Um, we think that sometimes it will reduce access. We don't always, we aren't convinced that it will um, improve quality of care. Of course, the affordability of it is, is a big thing. And sometimes we really think that certain things are only fit for the Western world. If we haven't developed yet, let's focus on clean water and let's focus on um, roads and let's focus on vaccinations. And we're not thinking about cath, and we're not thinking about um, CT scans, and you know, it's fine for you to have a tumor, but you've lived 50 years, and, and that's good enough. Um, in reality, we know that technology actually improves healthcare delivery. It is cost effective, and it does improve access. We're gonna show you um, some of that, as opposed to me just saying that. It improves workflow efficiency, it improves patient information management, and that's key. Just improving patient information management can cut the cost of service delivery tremendously because there's decreased duplication of testing. Um, patients call at a minute's notice, you know all there is to know about them or all they've told you. And so when they're calling you in the middle of the night, you know whether to tell this patient, yes, it's a high likelihood that you're having a heart attack as opposed to that this may be gas. And um, you know, therefore, patients can decrease the utilization of emergency rooms and urgent care, and, and so retain what little money they have and put it into higher yield um, testing and treatment. Um, we know it improves reliability and patient safety, and we can extend care to rural settings. Um, such as being off the grid in the middle of nowhere, ringing the place with lights, and basically showing through a proof of concept that you can decrease um, maternal deaths, fetal deaths, um, just by having technology, um, access, sanitary conditions, and good water. So it expands the reach of limited expertise, and of course it saves life. Um, so if you improve the quality of life, of course, it also improves um, how people go about the rest of the living ex experiment. So let's talk about the Heart Institute of the Caribbean. So we're going to just kind of have a little conversation um, ab about something that's actually in effect now. And you see how this played out, and we'll talk about some of the challenges. And I think that some of the challenges we've had can be extrapolated to any industry um, when you're trying to do um, something that is in a market that is not originally your own, that is still developing. Um, and like I said, there's a reason that you're developing as opposed to developed. So <clears throat> in 2005, when we started in Jamaica, population was only 3 million. Um, cardiovascular disease was the number one cause of death and disability. Access to cardiovascular care was limited. Um, there was no cardiac center of excellence. There was one cath lab in the entire island. It was at the university. It was um, several decades old. Uh, the quality of imaging was um, suboptimal. Still was being used, still is in use. Um, there were only five cardiologists on island at that time. And the, the data worldwide tends to show, for example, Nashville, um, Tennessee has a population of a million people. And there are about 250 cardiologists and at least 12 cath labs. You have an island of three million people with five cardiologists, all um, concentrated in the major population center of Kingston at that time, and one cath lab. Um, serving the entire island. And that meant that um, if someone needed to be seen or had a cardiac emergency, is having a heart attack in Westmoreland, um, which is about a four to six hour drive, depending um, from Westmoreland to Kingston, you're probably out of luck. And so um, it, it became an issue. Um, the waiting time to have what we call a very basic gateway test, a stress test was three to six months, and a waiting time for echocardiograms, which is even a lower um, gateway test, was also three to six months. Um, 
this is the Heart Institute of the Caribbean, that's our facility. So we looked at this and we thought, man, there is a huge market in which to play. Um, so our model was, we're gonna put this center and we're gonna use uh, smart, cost-effective use of technology. We know what we're doing. Um, it does require that we're actively involved because we're not going to find that skilled manpower on the ground, but we will be able to find ancillary and support staff. Um, and we're gonna leverage advances in technology to improve that access. We're gonna focus on training so that as opposed to what we found when we got there, where if an echocardiogram was needed, the doctor has to do, an echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart, by the way. The doctor would actually physically have to sit by the bedside and do the ultrasound, while there may be somebody in the next room who needed the services of the doctor emergently. And so there was no such thing, for example, as an echo tech, um, and we have them left, right, and center in America, you, you have a test that needs to be done, you write the order, the patient takes it to the lab and gets it done. The only time you interact with that patient again is when the patient brings the report to you. So you're, as, you as a physician, you as the skilled and knowledgeable source, you're not spending the lion's share of your time in doing technical work when what you're really being paid for and what your value proposition is, is your brain power, is the knowledge that you have. That's not as easily transferred, right? So um, the model was organization and a strong management team, capital formation and access, that's always sticky. Um, the whole idea that you had to shift from a position of receiving aid to sustainable development. The whole idea that if you're sitting back waiting on a charitable enterprise to come in to deliver um, healthcare on a rotating mission, you're waiting probably for that once a month, once a year mission. And what happens when those people have gone? So I've come in and I've evaluated 10,000 people and I've diagnosed hypertension or I've given glasses out and I've given medications to last for, you know, six weeks. So what happens when we've gone after a weekend or a week of really intensive care and good service and we're lauded and it's a really good thing. But what happens to that hypertensive when either they don't take their medication or they take it and it's suboptimal? Um, you won't find hypertensives in America going to see their doctor one time for the year because we know that untreated hypertension, maltreated hypertension, leads to kidney failure, blindness, erectile dysfunction, heart disease, heart failure, the, nine, the whole nine yards. So you've done a really good job on a mission, you've gone in and you've done that, but you really haven't shifted the needle at all. You haven't moved the ball. So we had to make that case that we have to shift from a mode of waiting on other people to solve our problems to creating a, a, a vehicle for this to be sustainable so that next year, we're there. Two months from now, we're there. If somebody wakes up in the middle of the night with a heart attack, somebody is there. And we also have to create a model that shifts it just from overseas expertise and create a model where people on the ground are also learning so that ultimately, as I say, it becomes sustaining. And specialization and economics of scale, um, innovative use of technology, we're not gonna say everything, but you create strategic partnerships, um, you develop internal capacity. And so the HIC solution really was to put it on the ground. And you'll see um, pretty much all the staff that you see here are Jamaicans, trained in Jamaica. Some of them had um, their skill set prior to us arriving. You'll find that in developing countries. Um, many people come overseas, as many of us did, um, to learn and you go back home but there's no place to practice your craft. Um, or you went home and where there was a nuclear lab, the nuclear lab's now broken but there was no provision because it, it was either donated and there's no provision for maintenance or no provision to replace it. And so it's broken and so now you're a really well-trained nuclear tech and there is no nuclear lab in the entire island. So you have people who are underemployed and are not using the benefit of their skill. And so we have some of those on staff as well. 
but we also <clears throat> have people that we transferred um, knowledge and skill set to. And so we have a full-fledged cardiac center um, in Kingston with a couple branches elsewhere. Um, we also have, um, we had several physicians who trained here and, and who are practicing at home and some staff um, from our local offices who will go in rotation to Jamaica, runs there. And so you have pictures in the cath lab and tilt table and on the stress test uh, machine and doing echoes and the whole nine yards. So, oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> Um, I want to just show you um, a profile of a day in the life of HIC and why it's important, I think, to provide care. But while this is trying to load, I want to tell you why it's a good business model. So you're looking at, okay, let's go. So it may be simple patient like this coming miles. She may be um, very rural, a farmer. Um, or unemployed, and you wonder how would she pay for the cost of her services? Our services are not free. Um, there, huh? <laughs> and there is no intention for it ever to be free. What we run is what we call an open access model that says if someone, we, we do um, rating where we will rate you financially, and if someone is truly unable to afford or is indigent, then nobody's turned away for an inability to pay. But in every place in the world, even in the poorest environments in the world, the reason that there is a GDP not of zero is that somebody in that place is making a lot of money. There is a millionaire everywhere in the world. There are people who are doing financially well everywhere. There are middle class people everywhere, of course, and then there is a huge burden of people who are poor. And so um, you can't just say because some place looks poor that they can't afford your services. You also have to look at the culture. And in a place, for example, like Jamaica and many places in the West Indies, I'm sure in many places in Latin America, South America, the familial bonds are, are very tight. And so you have three million Jamaicans on the island and you have about four million Jamaicans who don't live in Jamaica, who like me may be a professor at Vanderbilt University or you may have um, somebody who is a nurse in New York City, who is the head matron at um, Brigham Women's Hospital, who you may go to your doctor's office tomorrow and he comes out and you're straining your ear and you catch an accent and you find out that he's from Soweto. Um, so there are people all over who are in America who are not originally Americans. And depending on the culture, many of us are supporting a huge number of people in our hometowns. And so you can't just look at um, the purchasing parity or the purchasing power of people on the island. I think you also have to consider the cultural bonds and know that very many cases are actually paid for by people who don't live in Jamaica. Um, and in fact, a line item in the budget of Jamaica is what we call reparations. And that is a thing, yeah, that is a thing that well, it, it's, it's, it was a startling concept um, about 15 years ago when it became an actual line item where you said, oh, this is how much we intend to get from sugar. This is how much we intend to get from bauxite. This is how much we intend to get from cane. This is how much we intend to get from tourism. And this is how much we intend to get from reparations. And what are reparations? Us sending money to our relatives back home. And over time, that's gone from the bottom of the pyramid and has now become, I think, number two source of um, revenue to the island. And that is not only used to purchase things, it's used for day-to-day -day living, but it's also used to balance the budget because it's taxed. So even the government's relying on this. And so it makes a difference. Um, why do we make sure that it costs something? Because something that costs something has value. So people tend to take better care of their health 
when they have invested in it. Um, it also means that it's sustaining. It means that there is revenue in order for us to expand so, and to move into different areas of the island. We've now moved to Ocho Rios, which is a smaller, uh, more touristed area of the island. We've moved deeper into the center of the island in Mandeville. So we now have three facilities in Jamaica, not all of which do every procedure, but then we use technology. So we have a web-based um, image management portal. You're gonna see that. We train the CV techs for diagnostic studies. We engage telecardiologists. So sometimes doc may be sitting here reading an echo and you'll see how that's done. Um, we may have somebody in Egypt reading echoes in Kingston or stress tests or nuclear studies. Um, we have people in Spain who are on our adjunct uh, faculty. Um, we find that the turnaround time is fast. Web-based interpretation um, improves access and outcomes. It means that people who have tests done in Jamaica and who may need um, therapies and have to come overseas, we can provide um, access to a doctor here and they can log into our system and see exactly what was done, when it was done. Sometimes they can even look in real time. And we do that a lot with people who ultimately, we cath and they, they have three vessel disease and so we can't open up the vessels and put a stent in because that they have three vessels that need to be done. So that patient will need cardiac bypass. Many times they come to America to get that done and um, the doctor can then just look in and see it reported in exactly the format that we would report it in if we were practicing um, down the street um, at Mass General or at Vanderbilt or at any facility. And so this is kind of our setup. We have the echo lab, for example, a remote echo lab. You know, it's connected through a switched hub. You have the reading room, you have the physician's office, and then you have a RAID server. And you may have somebody in Nashville, like I said, or that may have, you know, um, somebody may be on vacation and he decides that instead of sending it to a telecardiologist, he's going to read it. So he may have three in his box waiting for him to be read, right? So access is just a click away. And um, this is kind of how it's done. I'm going to um, skip over that and just tell you what the impact has been. So in 2005, when we went to Jamaica, we talked about that the waiting time for ECHO was three to six months. Today, the waiting time is same day. If you call me and say you need an echocardiogram, you can get it done today. This is also an interesting thing. It's not just about HIC anymore. There's an energy to innovation and there's an energy to um, investment. And some people call it copying, you know, but sometimes it only is about showing that something can be done and then other players will move into the market. And so we're not anymore the only players in cardiology care in the island. We are the major players, but it then becomes incumbent upon us to do what we do better and to constantly not just innovate but to manage our original innovation to constantly make our service delivery better to go into areas so we're not just at the root of cardiology disease but at the branches as well to be talking about um, erectile dysfunction and to be talking about diabetes and to be talking about these other things so we see stress test time um, has been cut as well from three to six months to same day cardiology consultation you can get it on the same day um, Healthcare costs have been reduced. Easy thing, limited access drives up cost. It's a, it's a scarce commodity. Now that you can get it anywhere, costs for echocardiogram have gone down from when we came 275 US dollars equivalent to um, 150 US dollars equivalent now. I would compare and contrast that though with the US where reimbursement for an echocardiogram could be $800. So you're putting your price point lower, but you're also offsetting that because you're getting cash on the barrel head. Somebody walks in, they're paying you that money, you're not waiting three months for the insurance company to reimburse. So they're using your money and having the benefit of that while we have our money in our hand. Also, the cost of labor, of course, is lower, which is part of the reason that people would look even in these emerging markets. And of course, there's less uh, competition, and so your volumes also are higher. Um, so 
from wide inequality in care to equality of care and expertise, we now have open access and we've now been uh, given the opportunity or we've seized the opportunity to extend the quality of care widely to rural settings and, and we think we've contributed to improve quality of life. Um, something that we haven't said um, when I talked about competition is also when we came and I told you about five cardiologists on the island, there are now as of today, 15 cardiologists in the island. In the past 10 years, there's been a growth of 10. There, it, there is actually a pretty long latency period to train to be a cardiologist. And it means that seeing proof of concept, seeing what was happening, seeing the direction, so many people who were in the pipeline of training elected to go on to further training in cardiologists. And where there had only been three in the past, in the 30 years prior to us coming, there have been 10 new cardiologists trained just in the 10 years since we've been there. So this is also an area, I think, that when you're in a developing market, you have an ability not just to have economic impact for yourselves, but you really have an opportunity to change a landscape um, in a good way. So I'm gonna end there as talking about Jamaica, and um, I want Doc to come up and just give you a few quicker about um, another market in which we're playing, Nigeria, and to see how that um, has impacted things. I want to also um, just say, someone asked earlier about what happens when, to, when you have, let's see, yes, changes. So for example, political instability. Um, and I know people have been looking, for example, at some of the changes. Okay. If, no, no, one second. Yeah. Some people have been looking, for example, at um, some of the changes in Nigeria. Let's talk about like Boko Haram or even in Africa in general when there was the whole Ebola scare earlier this year. And so you'd have people looking at emerging markets and thinking, oh, South Africa is a no no because you know Africa has Ebola. And this is part of where travel is really important. If you're thinking about uh, global markets, um, it's about having a good idea of um, the world and the world map, to having a good appreciation of where things stand, and to realize, for example, that Mexico is far closer to Alabama than South, Amer than South Africa is to Nigeria. Or to know that I can get to England from Jamaica in a shorter time than I could get from um, Sudan, for example, to South Africa. And so you start thinking about if there is Ebola in California, people don't stop from work in Nashville, Tennessee. Or if there is a bombing at, um, if there's a shooting, for example, a school shooting um, in Colorado, we don't keep our children home in Mobile, Alabama. So I think an appreciation for the markets in which you want to play will also direct your decision making on whether or not global and emerging markets are the, the battlefield that you all want to choose. Morning. Okay. Is it working? Can you hear me? All right. I'm going to continue the conversation by uh, talking about uh, we chose to you know, show two case studies of what we're doing in emerging markets. We have several other investments that we're involved in, uh, but I think these two will give you a good idea of what the opportunities are and what the challenges are and uh, they're illustrative. So I will turn our attention to West Africa and uh, for a minute. Um, again, as Dr. Boss said, uh, you look at these things uh, from a, as the eyes of a diagnostician. Uh, you look at what the problem is, and then you think about what the solution could be. 
uh, one of the uh, things we'll say was, uh, you know, think, and maybe you don't have to have a question. Maybe what you have is a comment on how some problems could be solved. Uh, let's look at Nigeria for a minute. Uh, one of the problems we have now uh, is uh, limited access to care. And uh, that limited access to care is driven largely by a lack of uh, timely information that matters. Uh, if you actually think about it, the beginning uh, solution to any problem is to get reliable information. Uh, that is what we do first. Uh, you get, you do your due diligence, you try to get the right information. If you get the right information, then you can begin to address the you know, problems. So once we look at the landscape in Nigeria, we realize that a lot of people are denied access to care because they don't even have the information. A lot of people rely on uh, what they call patent medicine dealers for their routine health care needs. Uh, if you understand that those patent medicine dealers, some of them did not even finish you know, uh, three years in primary school, and they are running a medicine shop, and they are selling you medications for cardiac care, for oncology care, and so on. And um, I mean, I have a lot of anecdotes that you know, I've seen that I've been in one of those shops in Nigeria, and uh, a woman walks in with a prescription written from a doctor. Now, I'm a cardiologist, and then that prescription had seen it, you know, was given a prescription for Novask, you know, for treatment of high blood pressure, gives it to this, uh, you know, quack uh, patent medicine dealer. The man takes a look at it. I said, my goodness, who gave you this? He says, one doctor, and the man said, these people, I don't know what they're doing. He rumples it, throws it away. And they say the man wants to kill you. And then pick something from the shelf that don't have nothing to do with uh, hypertension. And then gives to the woman. And the woman says, oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, usually you kind of want to stay uninvolved in other people's business. But this is not his business anymore. So I had to speak up and say, you know, listen, this is what I do. You're the one trying to kill her. Of course, he wasn't happy that I cost him a sale, right? But this is the kind of thing that happens when people don't have access to timely information. They don't have the knowledge. They become victims because they're seeking help, but they end up with the wrong people. So what we decided to do in Nigeria is to look at ways to begin to address the um, information deficit. Now. That information deficit is a starting point to addressing the larger issue of healthcare access in the place. Uh, one is what happens at the middle of the night when some child develops a temperature. As a doctor, we know what the potential consequences could be. And most people who are not doctors know what the potential outcomes could be because they have gotten some education and public health enlightenment in another way. Now, but when you're looking at unlettered, illiterate people who have not had the opportunity and the exposure, they may not necessarily know what to do. They need to be able to access somebody who knows what to do. So what are the possible things that can happen when a child has fever at two o'clock in the morning? The child is running a high temperature, is shivering, and the mother is confused. Now, we're talking about places where there is no light, the roads are not motorable, you can't come out of your house by two o'clock in the morning because you might be robbed, right? And even if you leave your house and go to the hospital, you might find nobody. But you need somebody to tell you what to do. Now, this child is running a temperature now, this child running a temperature might be at risk for going into seizures, and that could be life-threatening. They could be brain dead. But a simple solution as a tepid sponge bath, you know, to say, okay, take some towel, soak it in water, and sponge bath the child could be the difference between life and death. Now, what, how do you get that information to this person who doesn't know? Well. What is it that everybody has? 
Does anybody here have a cell phone? That's not a trick question. Is yes? Is there anybody here without a cell phone? No, right? So cell phones, mobile phones, uh, have given the developing world an opportunity to leapfrog in so many areas. Uh, any country that doesn't have the infrastructure for landlines today will not waste millions of dollars trying to put that infrastructure. That's what wireless technology is all about. So if we look at Nigeria, for example, um, we have, it's over actually, this says 60 to 90 million, but we have about 120 million unique cell phone, mobile phone accounts. So every person has access to a mobile phone. And what we decided to do is to build a national medical call center that gives people access to a doctor 24 hours, seven days a week. In the United States, for example, there is a mandate for doctors to be available for their patients. So that's why doctors are on call. There is no such mandate in many of these countries. And therefore, you will not have access to your doctor, even if you had one. That because there is no mandate for the doctor to be on call, when you call the doctor, first of all, you will not even have a number to call the doctor because the office is closed at 4 p.m. And that is it, you're on your own. So the, what we have set up is a doctors on call service, which is a national medical call center that is based on low cost subscription that allows the people that have bought into the subscription service to be able to access a doctor 24 hours, seven days a week from wherever they are. In line with that, we've also gone ahead to set up what we call concierge clinics, you know, docs clinics to provide an avenue for people who need to be seen, to go in and get seen, and those are also running on the basis of membership. You pay a low cost membership fee for the year, and you don't need to worry about what to pay to go see a doctor. Now, again, it's about understanding the culture and understanding the imperatives there. Because a lot of people have financial needs, to go to the doctor when they need to go to the doctor may not be possible because they don't have the resources at the time. But it is easy to have a relative who may live in Boston or New York make a one-time payment of a one-year membership for them, and that assures that they can get access whenever they need to have access. This is uh, in our clinic in Nigeria. Uh, one of the other things we also see is the narrative that because it's an emerging market, because it's a, a you know, low-income country, therefore people should expect and only have mediocre facilities. That is a wrong narrative because what happens is that when you put those mediocre facilities, then those who have the resources will not use it. They will fly out to go somewhere. And then those who you are trying to serve, you cannot sustain it because there's no revenue coming in. And then if you're waiting for charity, now we differentiate, we have no problem with humanitarian aid. That is different from charity. You know, I always challenge everyone to tell me, if you know any country that has moved up economically dependent on charity, tell me which country that is. The man who is giving charity is making his money somewhere. That is why he's able to give charity. So we have pockets of poverty in the United States as well. The Mississippi Delta is regarded as one of the poorest places in the United States. I have never had anyone advocate dropping bags of rice for people in Mississippi Delta. Everyone is talking about how do we bring investment? How do we build the infrastructure? I want you to have the same outlook to developing countries. Do not have an outlook of pity right? The outlook is what can you do to bring sustainable development in these environments? You can make money by doing good. There is, is, they're not mutually incompatible. So this idea that if you are going to make money in a developing country, then you're the you know, incarnate of the devil, that is wrong-headed because the same people who are preaching charity are making their money somewhere, but you cannot prosper depending on charity. So we built a program 
uh, that um, we believe is world-class program. And it's very, um, it's the clinics are designed to be like the clinics people will go to in Boston or New York or Massachusetts or Nashville, Tennessee. We have doctors who are also trained to the best abilities and then these clinics are networked to international centers of excellence. So right in Nigeria there, studies are being done. You can pull it up from London, you can pull it up from New York, and then so you have expertise that is tapped into without co-locating that expertise on the ground because that's an expensive thing to do. So this is, um, but there are also some other challenges that people in rural areas that may not be able to access the clinic that is in the main city. Now, that's what technology is all about. We also link these people up with what we call remote uh, consultations and second opinion, and that is what the Docs Telemedicine Service is all about. So with, again, the way we're working with uh, NetMed in New Mexico, that have built a platform for us that you can sit in the comfort of your house and then go on the website uh, plug into the web RTC, set up remote consultation as long as you have bandwidth. Now, it is not all rosy because where we're playing, the bandwidth is not completely great yet, but we have also seen the leaps and bound in bandwidth, in, in the cost of bandwidth. Um, the Facebook, the growth of Facebook and Twitter and all this is happening exponentially in Africa and it's because young people now are getting access on their smartphones. We believe in the next few years, the bandwidth issue will become solved, and instead of wasting time complaining about lack of access, we use the bandwidth to expand access to the people. There are certain things you still need to be seen physically, but a lot of things, remote consultations, e -con electronic consultations, second opinion, telemedicine can solve, and that is what we're doing in West Africa, you know, right now, and again, is using technology applications to solve existing problems. Uh, it's not always about selling a product. It's also about selling a service. And then we think, as young people, if you're looking at this market, you have to be thinking creatively, what innovation can I bring to solve an existing problem? All right? So I'll leave it here for now.